And we move on to the next speaker, which is Jos Mitteldorf. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you. But we can't see your slides yet. I don't have slides. Oh, OK. That's, uh... you, get to, you get to watch me talk. Just um, I'm, I'm going to ask for a lot of listening uh, because the, ask you to think about some new ideas. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here today. This is such a prestigious and impressive group. I'm honored to be a part of it. For your interest and by way of apology, I'm fasting. I'm on day four of a fast. Sometimes this slows me down. I stumble over words. Um, it's part of my own anti-aging therapy. So to begin, I want to talk about my favorite topic which is the data beta project. It's about to get off the ground after long delays. We're hoping to start recruiting subjects in November. This is a community-based study designed to screen for anti-aging interventions already in use that have large effects, at least 20 years of life extension. So 20 years, you might say, if such things exist, we'd certainly know about them already. I'd say not necessarily. This field is moving very fast. The number of strategies that have been introduced in the last few years is large. Um, they were unknown before. And also, this is something that sets our study apart. Data beta is designed to look for combinations of known supplements and diets that synergize together. The premise is that most supplements and diets are based on a small number of pathways. So their action is probably redundant. For example, if we're taking metformin and also fasting, uh, we don't get extra life extension from one compared to the other. But maybe hidden among these combinations, we'll find some unexpected synergies, the opposite of redundancy. So the combinations of strategies have extraordinary effect, perhaps far larger than the benefit you'd expect just by adding the separate benefit. We're looking for this, uh, and no one else is. Uh, it's sort of standard in the field that we study one, one intervention at a time. And there's this hidden assumption that, well, they, they'll add together as if the effects were linear. And of course, that's not true. We all know that that's not true. So we'll be recruiting 5,000 people like you, biohackers, early adopters, people who are knowledgeable about the field and who are motivated to follow some combination of new and proven strategies for life extension. Every participant will fill out an extensive questionnaire so we know exactly what they're doing. We're not asking them to do anything different, just what they're doing already. And then we'll supply methylation testing at the beginning and the end of a two-year trial period. We'll look for people who are aging very slowly, or maybe they're even younger at the end of two years than they are at the beginning. Uh, so our end point is the difference in age as measured by epigenetics at the beginning and the end. In analyzing the data, the tail of the curve is going to be most informative. This is the people who appear to be not aging at all or even aging backwards, what do these people have in common that we can learn from this? And if we find commonalities between the people who are aging slowest, um, then we're, we'll say we've, we've got something really interesting to report. This is a nonprofit venture. There'll be no proprietary IP. I'll do the initial data analysis, but then all that's data from the study will be uploaded to a website where it's publicly available. And I fully expect that other researchers uh, will mine the data and find patterns that I've missed. So it's in that sense, a large scale collaboration. Another sense in which is a collaboration, this is crowdfunded. Again, people like you, I've seen a lot of interest already, or maybe a major funder will step forward and boost the, um, project along. In fact, progress thus far has been made possible by a generous startup grant from Didier. And I'm really grateful for that. And there's also been cooperation with uh, my partners in this. My project manager, Walt Crompton, partners at McGill University, 
Moshe Sif, and my daughter, Sarah, who's injected some energy to push us over the starting line. So now for the main feature, which is about theory and biomarkers, which is I, what I signed up to talk about. Another name for biomarkers is surrogates. We need surrogate markers of age to evaluate candidate anti-aging interventions because if we don't, then we either have to use short-lived animals or else we have to wait a very long time for human lifespans to play out. So there's a strong motivation to find surrogates, but then choosing the right biomarker becomes crucial. We want something that's highly correlated with age, but that's not enough. We really need to understand the fundamentals of aging before we can have confidence in any surrogate. So a trivial example, the lines in a person's face are pretty well correlated with age, but if we use this for a surrogate, then no one would say that getting a facelift was an anti-aging intervention. We're pretty confident that facelifts don't make people live longer. This is a trivial example, I know, but it helps us to think why isn't wrinkled skin a suitable surrogate to evaluate aging interventions? Well, one answer might be because no one ever dies of wrinkled skin. People die of heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's dementia. So we might be motivated to look for surrogates that are connected to these, maybe arterial stiffness and HDL are markers for heart risk. Maybe cognitive decline is something we can measure as a marker for AD. Colon polyps, pap smears, PSA tests uh, are markers for various kinds of cancers. But this gets very complicated. And we notice that all these problems are downstream results of aging, not upstream causes. So we're motivated to look upstream for causal factors that lead to all three of these things. For example, inflammation is measured by CRP and IL-6. Inflammation contributes to all diseases of aging. Decline of the immune function is always is also an upstream cause and perhaps the loss of brain cells, muscle cells to apoptosis. This may be another upstream cause. Can we go further upstream? So for this is why a theoretical understanding of aging becomes relevant. And I know we don't agree on what are the upstream causes, but uh, it's something we ought to be talking about. I'm gonna go back to eight years ago, 2012, I was one of several people scattered around the globe who started to speculate that changing gene expression was a primary upstream cause of aging. A very young Adiv Johnson and Joao Pedro, Tom Rando at Stanford, we all published separate papers proposing an epigenetic model for aging. It was well established and uncontroversial that growth and development were governed by gene expression, also known as epigenetics. And gene expression is under the body's control. The idea that the body is programmed to grow and for organs to specialize when we're young, well, that's natural enough. But the idea that this program might continue into a phase of self-destruction as uh, Blagoslani has theorized, this raised doubts in some people. Now, at the same time, unbeknownst to those of us who were writing about gene expression and aging, Steve Horvath was putting the idea to the test. Methylation is one of the ways that the body controls gene expression. And as it turns out, methylation is relatively easy to measure in localized detail. A map, in fact, of what sites on each chromosome are methylated or unmethylated. Well, Steve got hold of several methylation databases with people of all ages from in utero to over 100. He searched for methylation sites that are most tightly correlated with chronological age. There are 18 million methylation sites that are in the human genome. And of these, just a few hundred thousand change consistently with age. He compiled a list of the best 353 sites that become either more or less methylated with age. And from these, he constructed what's what he called a methylation clock. Um, 
this is a function that reliably and tightly correlates with age with an R of 96%. So what about that other 4%? Here's where I want to ask for your focused attention. Think about this for a moment with me. Horvath showed that the residual 4% was actually a predictor of future mortality and morbidity. The Horvath methylation clock was derived from computer algorithms that know nothing about biological age, know nothing about these markers. They only know the, the mathematics used only chronological age. And chronological age is, of course, a very strong predictor of mortality. But so we'd expect that the methylation clock would also be a good predictor of mortality. But the surprise here is that methylation age is actually a better predictor of mortality and morbidity than chronological age itself. So this 96% contains information about chronological age. The residual 4% is not just scatter. It actually contains information about the difference between biological and chronological age. That extra information about mortality and morbidity was not put into the algorithm by hand. It emerged from the mathematics. So the natural inference from this is that methylation is an upstream cause of aging. Methylation is an upstream cause of aging. The Horvath methylation clock is just what we were looking for, an upstream biomarker that can be used as a surrogate. And in other words, this confirmed the conjecture that Jao Pedro and Rando and myself were all making. The fact that the Horvath clock predicts mortality better than age itself means that methylation is a driver of aging. Uh, so this 2013 clock is, was already very valuable, but can we do even better? The methylation sites that comprise the Horvath clock must contain a lot of the drivers aging, of aging, but I'm speculating that mixed in among those are some responses to aging that are not drivers. The theory is that as we get older, the body turns on self-destruction pathways like inflammation, like excess apoptosis, and it turns down protective pathways and repair, like the immune functions shutting down, stem cells become less viable. All this is driven by upstream methylation changes or drivers of aging. But at the same time, the body is responding, fighting with itself, trying to repair the damage that it's creating itself. And this comes from methylation changes too. And I call these downstream changes, the responses to damage. So here's the crucial point in my take home message. All these methylation changes, upstream and downstream are useful if what you wanna do is just measure somebody's biological age or their future risk. But if you want to evaluate an intervention to see if the body is getting younger, we want this surrogate to contain only the upstream drivers and not the downstream responses. Why is that? It's not just that the downstream changes are useless biomarkers like wrinkles or gray hair. They actually make our clock less useful for what we want it for. Let's say our, our body is making the body, let's say our intervention is making the body younger according to the drivers. What's it that's what we want. Is it turning aging off at the source, shutting off the spigot of damage? But suppose our intervention makes the body, quote, younger, according to the responses to aging. It's the opposite. We've actually shut down some mechanisms that are responding to aging and trying to rescue the body. With this context, I want to follow Horvath's next two ventures into uh, to aging clocks. In 2018, with Morgan Levine as a student at the time, they designed together a procedure pretty close to what I think is ideal. First, a composite was constructed out of set 10 markers of aging, including chronological age as one element, but also including inflammation, blood glucose, albumin, creatine, etc. This produced an aging score for each subject in the database, which Levine calls phenoage, and the methylation sites were chosen for inclusion in the clock according to how well they correlate with phenoage, the aging score. 
this clock was explicitly enriched in drivers. So pheno age predicts mortality and, more better, and morbidity better than chronological age. And remarkably, the pheno age methylation clock predicts mortality and morbidity even better than pheno age itself. So pheno age is the raw markers. The pheno age clock is the methylation associated with these markers. And the pheno age methylation clock does better than pheno age as a predictor of mortality and morbidity. Um, I, I think the pheno age clock is the best one that we have now. Um, I wanted to talk about the grim age clock, which I think is actually a step backwards. It illustrates um, a procedure that enriches the the clock in responses to aging rather than drivers. For example, the grim age clock depends on the smoking status of the person. And there's a meth methylation image of smoking. But you'd expect that smoking doesn't kill us by uh, changing our methylation. It's killing us by destroying lungs and arteries. So the methylation changes associated with smoking are probably responses to aging, not drivers. And this is what we don't want in our aging clock used to evaluate anti-aging procedures. To close, I want to talk about what can we can do, do in the future to do even better than the pheno age clock. Well, the pheno age procedures are, I think, just right. Start with a set of markers that we know are causes of aging. Um, I'd recommend looking at inflammatory cytokines, NF-kappa B, looking for apoptosis, maybe P53, looking for mTOR, perhaps oncogenes, perhaps genes that are expressed only in stem cells, and look for methylation changes that are highly associated with, with all of these, rather than with um, responses to aging. And second, to improve on the Horvath clock, all the Horvath clocks are linear. They're designed to work from womb to tomb. And we know that the genes that are turned on and off during childhood are very different from those that are turned on and off later in life. We should have separate clocks for development and aging. Or if you like, we could have a single nonlinear algorithm that just uses different methylation sites at different ages. Now, this is a substantial opportunity for improvement. And I know people at um, Elysium have done that with their index clock. And third, there are separate positive coefficients and negative coefficients in the Horvath clocks. We should optimize a methylation clock that just uses the positive co coefficients and just the negative coefficients, and then re re combine those two later on. And this will prevent the cancellation of large positive terms with large negative terms, uh, which I, I believe it throws a monkey wrench into the optimization process, which has been used so far. So in conclusion, the present generation of methylation clocks are already really good. They're getting better every year. And I'm confident we can make a methylation clock that's even better. And it's, it will be everything that we need to evaluate candidate anti-interventions, anti-aging interventions in the future. And um, that's, that's what we all need. That's what we're here for. Thank you. OK, thank you so much, uh, Jos. Um, let's see if there is some question. Um, Yeah, I think that there are some people who are asking, of course, um, if 
methylation drives aging, then what drives methylation? Is it the chicken or the egg problem we are running into here? Since methylation happens in every cell in the body, there must be some, uh, I, not, not there must be, I'm guessing that there's some central clock that controls aging, or perhaps the clock is methylation itself. That maybe that's, uh, I, I'd say we don't know the answer to that, but people like um, the Conboys and like the, the groups at Stanford looking at blood factors, I think maybe we'll have an answer to this question uh, over over coming years. If there are, if there is an upstream from the methylation changes, it's in the factors in the blood that uh, are um, c are controlling methylation and other aspects of epigenetics. Okay, thank you so much.